Prayer is as necessary as the air. Prayer is something done out of love because you understand you're in a loving relationship. Prayer is to know God better. It's not an activity that you have to check off your list to be a good Christian. Prayer is not a wish list that you go through. Prayer is a conversation with a God that wants to converse with you. Prayer is a connection with God and understanding who God is. You want to have eternal life? It's to know who God is. It's to connect with God's character. It's to connect with God's presence. It's to connect with God's voice. It's to understand His purposes and His promises in life. We need it to live, and we won't fully understand the grace of God and His movement in our life without it. Come on. Who's ready to experience the fullness and experience all that God has for them? Come on. All right, third service, we gonna finish strong, right? And I know in here right now, I gotta have some happy people, because there's some Chiefs fans in here, and you need to be, th- hey, hey, there was some miracles that happened for you yesterday, so you better be thanking God, amen, right? And I'm not saying that with jealousy in my voice, although I am very jealous and I have to pray about it, that's the part of being a Packers fan, right? All right, I'm just a little jealous, all right? But in all honesty, God could care less about football, but I'm happy for you, kind of, all right? So let's be blessed. Guys, I'm pumped about today. We're diving into week three of our series, What is Prayer? But here's what I want, to, want you to understand real quick. I'm on one announcement. We're around in the corner, and we're going to the last week of 21 days of prayer. And it has been so good. I'm telling you, it's just been so good. I've had so many people come up to me, man, just with tears in their eyes. They're just, God's answering prayers. They're feeling God move. They're seeing things they've been praying for for so long, really be shaken. It's just powerful when you just carve out and say, God, I'm just putting you first. I'm telling you right now, there's something powerful about that. And I'm, I'm just so blessed to be a part of that and, and pray with you and be a part of that. We're seeing this whole stage is covered with your prayer request. I mean, I mean, every part of the stage, from front to side to side, is covered. And man, as soon as we go off the personal prayer, I'm telling you, every day, our people just unleash like an army, and they flood this stage, grabbing your prayer request, and they go to battle for you. And it's not like one time. I mean, they're getting passed around between everybody throughout the whole auditorium, going to battle and praying for you. I'm telling you right now, God's shaking some things up, and God's doing some big things. So if you got any prayer requests, fill out those cards and you'll get them at the, all the entrance and exits. Man, we want to continue to go to battle spiritually for you. But I also want to give you a little shameless plug. You should be here tomorrow. Like 6 a.m. early, but man, Jesus got up early to be with the Lord, so so can you. Come on, somebody, right? And I'm going to tell you right now, some people be like, well, it's already started. Listen to me, one week is better than no week's. And man, let's give one week just going all in, one week fast, and one week just saying, God, we're going to give it all and see what God does. It's kind of why I have this prayer, this series I'm doing, What is Prayer? Because I feel like a lot of people don't really understand really what prayer is. Like, some people might know about the activity, and you might know some prayers that you should recite, but you don't really understand the authority of it and the power of it, and, and you don't really understand. Some people are like, I don't even know how to pray. Like, Pastor Mike, I know you tell me to pray, but like, I sit down and like, I got like 30 seconds of things to say, and then I'm like, what do I do from here, right? Like, I don't know how, right? Like, I don't really know what it is. And so over the last several weeks, what we've been doing is really teaching what is the the beauty of prayer? What is the meaning of prayer? What's the power of prayer? And then I've been given some practical things on how do you pray. So if you've missed any of the messages, I want to encourage you, go online. I'm telling you right now, this is one of those series that have stretched me. They, it's made me grow. And if it's making me grow, man, I'm like, I get so excited about that because I know it's really connected with you. So I want to encourage you to be a part and, and, and get caught up. But there's a theme verse that's kind of been with us this entire time. It's found in 2 Chronicles. If you have your notes, pull them out. But it says it like this. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I just love that beginning. You see that? But God used a really important word, if. Because most people won't. Most people won't pray. Most people won't seek, their, seek God's face. Most people won't humble themselves and think they need God to move on their behalf. Most people will miss what God has for them. But I want you to see what he says. He says, if you do it, if you humble yourself, 
yourself. If you pray, do you notice he says, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to forgive you. And I'm going to do some restorations. I'm going to move. Like God wants to encounter you. He wants to move in your life. He wants to be prevalent in your life. It's not like he wants you just to speak something and it's gone. He wants to actually move on your behalf. You just got to be willing to actually humble yourself enough to do it. And here, if you want a simple definition of what prayer is, I think probably the most simplest definition is prayer is simply a conversation that leads to an encounter with God. Prayer is not words that you offer up and they get lost in the cosmos. Prayer is not just something that you recite because tradition says recite these words in a very specific way and that's how you do it. It's not some tradition that you find yourself in. Prayer really is this ability to speak and God actually interacts. And God encounters you and he, and, he, and he encompasses himself with you and he moves in your life. But the sad tragedy is most people don't know that and they don't experience that. John Calvin, he's one of our great theologians in history, said the greatest tragedy in the world is that God surely desires to encounter his people and move in the lives of his people, yet rarely do Christians actually participate in that. It's the greatest tragedy. I read a statistic that 64% of Americans call themselves Christians. Now, we don't know the level of their Christianity. 64%, it could just be that's what my parents are, so that's what I am. But they did ask one very specific question when they did this survey. And they asked the question, how many of you have had a life-changing, life-altering encounter with Jesus? 7% said that was true. 7%. That means you've got 57% of believers said they've never encountered God in a life-changing way. That breaks my heart. I'm gonna tell you right now, that breaks God's heart. Because he desperately wants to move in your life, yet most people don't. Most people don't encounter him. And most people don't understand the beauty of a relationship with God when you're fully devoted to him. Timothy Keller said it kind of like this. He said, it's like, it's like you received an inheritance. You received an inheritance, but in your mind, you have made up in your mind that the inheritance wasn't going to be very much. It wasn't really that big of an inheritance. And so you just kind of went about your day. You went about your life. You never went and picked up your inheritance. You never went and saw what the will was. You got busy. You just did your things. You got busy with your activities. And, and weeks turn into months. Months turns into years. And all of a sudden, you're just like, you know what? I probably should go look into that. And then you go to find out that that inheritance was immense riches and immense wealth. And you'd been spending years living a poverty life you were never intended to live. That's how most believers live. Most believers believers live in a poverty spiritual mindset because they don't understand the rich inheritance they have with God. They don't understand the fullness they have with God. They don't understand the beautiful nature that God wants to put in their life and want them to experience. And we walk around missing something that we were always intended to live. And people go, why? Why? It's because sometimes we know about God, but we don't know God. Right? Some people just do things because that's what you've always done, right? We go to church because that's what we do. We go to church. That's what my parents did. Or, or, well, I know about the Bible because I've been taught the Bible, but I've never really encountered the Bible myself. And we go through a knowledge encounter of life, and you have to understand there's not enough to know about God. You've got to experience God. I read years ago a book, and it said it kind of like this. He worded it like this. He goes, there's two different ways— you will ever discover the sweetness of what they called honey. There's two ways you can know that honey's sweet. The first way is somebody that you trust, like a parent or a teacher or a mentor, will tell you, hey, guess what? Honey's sweet. And you'll believe them because you trust them. And so you'll go through life going, hey, I know honey's sweet. And you'll have the knowledge that honey is sweet. But here's the problem, you've never tasted it yourself. So you have a partial understanding of the sweetness of honey. But the second way that you will know honey's sweet is when you actually 
put it upon your tongue and taste it for yourself. Then all of a sudden you're going to go, whoa. I mean, I knew honey was sweet. I didn't know it was that sweet. Like, I knew honey was good. I didn't know it was that good. I mean, I knew honey was so tasty. I didn't know it was that tasty. There's a difference between knowing something and experiencing something. And a lot of believers know the promises of God, but they've never experienced the promises of God. They know some of the things about God, but they've never encountered the things about God. And God is wanting you to not just have a knowledge of Him, but have an experience of Him. David said in Psalms, he says, oh, how sweet your words taste to me. They're sweeter than honey. God wants you to taste his sweetness. He wants you to experience his goodness. He wants you to walk in his abundance. He wants you to go from knowledge to experience. But so many don't. So many don't. And there could be a plethora of reasons. Could be because, you know what? You just don't think in your your mind you deserve it. You think that for some reason there's some people that are chosen and some people are not. You don't think you're good enough, or you don't think you have the capacity. Maybe it's because you just don't have spiritual disciplines in your life. And so you've never left the capacity to receive from God because everything else is a priority over God. And you're a casual Christian. You're not a devoted disciple. And if it's convenient, you'll allow it in, but if it's not, you don't. Maybe there are sins in your life. Maybe you have allowed things that are inappropriate in your life, and it's holding you back. And what's happened is you've grown accustomed to the processed sugar of this world, and you don't know how good God's honey is, his sweetness, his promises really is, because you've been lied to long enough that you're missing all that God has for you. James says it like this. He says, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Watch this. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. You've ever asked yourself, why are my prayers not answered? Why am I not receiving all that God has for me? Why am I not experiencing what you're talking about and the promise you're talking about and the sweetness of honey? It's because your loyalty is divided between God and the world, and you're unstable in everything you do. Listen to me. You cannot be the Lord and Savior of your life on one side of your life and then try to dip your toe into the things of God. You won't reach it. You can't be like selfish with every part of your life and then just a casual percentage you want to dip your toe into the things of God and think you're going to experience it. You got to go all in. And this is not a comfortable conversation, but there's a reason why Jesus said, not everybody that knows me is my follower. Not everybody that calls out to me, I know them because there's people that know about me that haven't experienced me. It's why Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you got to pick up your cross every day and die to yourself. You got to travel down the narrow path that leads to life. You got to go all in. You want to experience the sweetness of God's honey and the goodness of God's honey, you got to get your foot out of the world and fully into God. That's the lifestyle he wants you to live. But the question is, is why? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it to go all in with God? And I think the biggest problem why people don't experience God is they really don't think honey's that sweet. They really don't think God's really that good. Like they want God enough to get them to heaven, but they don't want God enough for their life to be completely consumed by his goodness. Because in your mind, you're questioning, is it really better than all of the rewards of this world? Is it really better than all the urges I feel inside? Is it really better to fully surrender? And that's a problem that not just you've wrestled with, that's a problem humanity wrestles with. When you're reading, I'm going to park today in Ephesians chapter 3, and it's a letter written by Paul to the church in Ephesus, but there's a point in it where Paul starts praying. He's praying over this church. And I want to park in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, but I want you to see this. If If you're taking notes, pull it out, but follow along. Watch this. Paul's praying this prayer. He says, I pray out of his glorious riches. Do you see that? He's not praying out of his glorious poverty. He's not praying out of the lack thereof. 
He's saying, I'm praying out of God's glorious riches, may he strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. What he's saying is, I'm trying to get you to grow. I'm trying to get you to understand. I'm trying to get you to understand all the depth of it so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Notice what he says here, surpasses knowledge, which means this isn't rational. This doesn't make sense. The world will tell you you're crazy. The world will tell you you're outdated. The world will tell you. And guess what? You've got to be okay being the minority. You've got to be okay being irrational. You've got to be okay wanting to go all in, even though it doesn't seem normal, because you want that honey. You want to taste and see that the Lord is good. So Paul's prays for three things over this church, and I think there are prayers that Paul would be praying over you today if he was writing you a letter. And that first one is that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. Now, this isn't salvation because Paul's writing to a group of believers. What he's telling them is, is I'm wanting you to experience the life-transforming spirit of Jesus. I want you to encounter the move of God. I want you to experience God moving in your life in the most miraculous ways. I want God to dwell with you, and you know every step of the way. God has never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's with you. I want you to understand the power of knowing you have God with you for forever. Get that in your spirit. And he says, the only way you can access that is through faith, which means you've got to believe for something. You have to have a faith for something bigger. You got to have a desire and a craving for something more. You got to actually want to taste and see that the Lord is good. And a lot of people go, well, what's faith? It's this ambiguous term, right? Well, Hebrews says it like this, Faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Notice what he says. First, it's confidence. What's confidence? When you're confident in something, what, do you, what are you? When you're confident, you're fully believing it. It's true. Like you're rooted in it. You're planted in it. You know it is what it is. You know it's true. You can't sway it. You got your opinion. You're locked in. You got your your. Heels dug in, you know it's true. And what he's saying is, you got to have confidence that God is who he says he is. You got to have confidence in the power and the authority and the nature and the character of God. And a lot of people go, well, that sounds easier said than done. That's right. It's why you also have to have assurance. What is assurance? Assurance is this declaration, it's this proclamation, it's a pledge. It's something you're saying. Have you ever tried to have a deal with someone and you're trying to convince them that you're somebody you could trust? What do you say? You'll say, I assure you this will happen. I assure you this contract will take place. I assure you our warranty is good. What are you doing? You're giving them a pledge. You're declaring that this will happen so that they grow in their confidence. And what Paul or the writer of Hebrews is saying here is if you want to fan the flames of your faith, you've got to learn to start declaring. You've got to learn to start proclaiming. You've got to learn to start declaring the things of God and the promises of God and the nature of God. And you declare it and you declare it and proclaim it and as you declare it and you proclaim it your confidence in God grows the confidence of who God is grows and all of a sudden you start seeing with this confidence and boldness in your spirit you start making moves and start stepping towards that very promise that very breakthrough that very miracle you've been wanting and holding on to there is this stirring in your spirit when you have this faith that God is who he says he is so he wants you to have that in your mind. The second thing Paul prays for is this. He says, I pray that you would be established in the love of Christ. I love this word established. When you're established in something, you're not just a casual passerby. When you say something's established, what is it? It's rooted there. It's made its home. 
It's where it grows. It's where it's been raised. It's where it stays. It's established in something. And what does Paul say to be established in? The rewards of God? Did he say to be established in heaven as your ending goal? Did he say to be established in all of the material things you think you can get? What's he say? Be established in the love of Christ. He wants you to experience his love. He wants you to experience his goodness. He wants you to experience that his love is greater than anything you could ever ask or think or understand. He wants you to understand he loves you and he's always loved you and he will always and forever love you. Jesus' very words to his disciples says, there is no greater love than the one who lays down his life for his friends. He's looking at his disciples and saying, you're not just servants that follow me. You're also my friend. I love you as a friend. I love you with a relational love. I love you with a love that cannot go beyond just obligation, but familial love. I love you that way. I love how Paul says in Romans, oh, God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Aren't you glad God didn't wait for you to get your act together for him to love you? Aren't you glad God doesn't expect you to be perfect to love you? Because that's what we expect from people. We expect them to have their acts together before we'll ever love them. I'm so glad my God doesn't love me that way. I'm so glad my God sees me not by what I've done, but what I can be. I think that's probably why in Ephesians, when Paul's talking about the armor of God, what does he say? He says, put on your head the helmet of salvation. And I think he tells you to put on your head the helmet of salvation because he needs you to understand you've got to get this in your mindset. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Life can't. Death can't. Angel can't. Demons can't. Heaven can't. Hell can't. Nothing can separate you from the love of God because if you don't understand that the father of lies is coming after you, and you know what the father of lies is going to say? God doesn't really love you. You know what the father of lies is? God feels obligated to care for you. God puts up with you. God just pardons you. And these lies are going to try to keep you from being established and rooted in who God is and what he wants for you and the nature of it. So he's trying to get you to understand, if you want to walk in the fullness and the freedom of God, you got to make sure you understand, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And there ain't nothing in this world, nothing in my past could ever separate me from the love of God. I am his friend. While I was still a sinner, he sent Christ to die for me, and I walk in the completion of that forgiveness established in it. The third thing Paul says is this. He says, I pray that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you understand there's fullness in God? I'm telling you right now, you can actually be satisfied with God. You can walk in completion with God. That's why Paul says, when I'm hungry or whether I'm full, Whether I'm cold or whether I'm warm, whether I have little or I have a lot, I have found the art of being content with God. It's because that's his desire for you, to walk in his fullness. Watch what Jesus' very word says. He says, the thief comes, that's the devil, steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. God wants your life to be rich and satisfying. But have you ever asked yourself the question, why do so many Christians never experience that? Mike, you talk about it, but why do so many never experience his rich, satisfying? They never find the fulfillment in it. And I think it's because a lot of people don't realize there's a difference between salvation and sanctification. Salvation is when you are forgiven. Sanctification is as you grow into who you're supposed to be. And here's the difference. Salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't work towards it. You can't be good enough for God to forgive you. Ain't nothing you could ever do. Listen to me. It's all him. He does all of it. He does all the forgiving. He does all the saving. He does all of it. That's that's Jesus' job. But then after you receive his free gift of grace, there are choices you have to make in your life to determine whether you grow, to determine 
how you live your life to determine whether or not you experience all that God has for you. And there are choices God wants you to make. Paul says it like this in Ephesians. Let's go back to Ephesians 3. Watch this. He says, you got to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I like that word grasp. It means you got to reach out and take it. And not only do you reach out and take it, you firmly grab a hold of it. Like you grip it tight. You seize it. You reach in and you grab it. You got to want to have the things of God. You got to desire the things of God. You got to be passionate for it. You got to want it in life. A lot of people go, Pastor Mike, why are you so, why are you so passionate all the time? You get so loud, and you're dancing up front, and, and, you, and you get so loud up here and get excited. Why? It's because I've tasted how sweet God's honey is. I've grabbed a hold of it. I've literally drank it by the gallons. I've got a sweet tooth for God. I know beyond just knowledge, but experience. And when you grasp a hold of it, you want to hold tight. You want to hold it. You don't want nothing else. Like, you don't want that, that processed sugar from this world. You want God's pure goodness in your life and it should lead you in all I'm left in all that God loves me I know the secrets of my past I know the stupid thoughts that still come into my mind I know that ugly disgusting envy and jealousy that tries to creep up in my heart I know that stuff about me. I know that times I'm selfish. And yet when I give it to God, he doesn't smack me. He loves and forgives me. And when I cry out to God, he doesn't turn his back on me, but he responds. I am who I am because of his love. And God wants you to experience that sweetness of him. He wants you to be overwhelmed by it. There's an old theologian, he's an he's a evangelist and author back in the 1800s, Dwight L. Moody. And I remember reading in one of his books years ago, he's talking about how he was at a prayer service in New York City, and he said that uh, God revealed himself to him. And he said, I had an encounter with God, and he said, I was overwhelmed by God's love to the point I had to ask God to stop because I couldn't bear it anymore. It was too much that my finite mind could understand. I don't know about you, but there's something about when you just get so overwhelmed by his goodness, every care of this world could just dissipate away. And you may think that's so far removed from what you could experience. It's not. But don't listen to the father lies because he wants you to think you can never have it. So you got to grasp it. Paul goes on to say, he says it like this, he says, May you have the power, together with all Lord's people, to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep the love of Christ is. He says you've got to firmly grab it. You've got to firmly seize a hold of it. But notice what he says. I pray that you have the power to do that. And that's kind of a weird term, right? Power? Like, I've got I to have power to do it. But what he's saying is you're going to have to wrestle with this thing. You're going to have to overpower some things in your life. You're going to have to capture this. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to wrestle with it because you're going to have to wrestle with those doubts that's making you think you're not good enough. You're going to have to wrestle with that self-deprecation that tells you you're not worthy of it. You're going to have to wrestle with this idea and understanding. You're going to have to wrestle with this thing of selfishness that wants you to be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life and wants you to walk in your conveniences and your pride. You're going to have to wrestle with these things, but when you wrestle with them and you don't let go, it's where God starts moving. I feel like Paul's telling you, you got to meditate on the things of God until you have a breakthrough, and you keep thinking, and you keep proclaiming, and you keep focusing, and you don't stop until it happens. It's like Jacob wrestling with that angel, and the angel says, let me go. And Jacob says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And some of you need to wrestle, and you need to wrestle with these thoughts, and you need to wrestle with your doubts, and you need to wrestle with your sacrifice, and you need to not let go until God blesses you. When you're weary, keep wrestling. When you're tired, keep wrestling. When you think you've hit the bottom of your life, you keep wrestling. When doubt's trying to rise up, you keep wrestling. And you don't let go until God gives you a breakthrough. 
Don't. And notice what it says. Together with all Lord's people. This is communal, guys. And some of you don't realize that because you still try to travel your faith journey with a solo faith. We're supposed to do this together. It's why I tell you to get in a life group because you need people to share. You need vital voices in your life. It's why I tell you to join a serve team. Go through next step party and join a serve team because you need the communal experience of being the body of Christ together. It's why 21 days of prayer is so powerful. Not because it's some special days. It's because we're doing it together. It's why coming to church on a Sunday is important because we're worshiping God together and we're praising God together. And as we're doing it, we're developing the power to grasp a hold of the things of God and start tasting the sweetness of His honey when the world all week long has wanted us to suck on its saturated, over-processed sugar. We need to get God in us and let him be all that we are. You've got to get that in your spirit. And what is the sweetness of honey? What is it that we're supposed to power and grasp a hold of? Well, Paul says it. He says, I want you to understand how wide the love of God is. Do you understand the distance God's grace covers in your life? Do you understand how far God will reach so that you could be forgiven? Isaiah says it like this. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as so. Scarlet is representing the color of blood. What the author's saying is, is, even if you had blood on your hands, God would forgive you. That if you did the most selfless, despicable thing in this world, you could still be forgiven by your God. How crazy is that? There is nothing too bad that God can't forgive you. And some of you have bought that lie that you're not good enough to be forgiven by God. Or you're not good enough to be more than what you are. But I'm telling you right now, he wipes you clean like snow. But not only that, he never throws it back in your face. The Bible says he chooses to remember your sins no more. You want to know the distance of God's love and forgiveness? It's infinitely wide. Psalm says he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. An infinite distance away. In those ancient times when David was writing this, they believed the world was flat. It was just four, a, a square, four corners. Some people still believe that, but hey, okay, okay. What, but, and basically, if you went east, that was an infinite distance. You would actually... Bam, you would fall off. You went west, fall off. North, south. But we know in our modern day that we have a globe, right? The world's a globe. But I want you to see how beautiful God is. Thousands of years ago, with a limited scientific knowledge, he pins those words, east is from the west. And some people go, what's the big deal? Because if he would have just moved it from north is to the south, that is no longer an infinite distance away. It's now measurable, is it? Because if you're heading north, you will continue to head north until you hit that north pole. Once you pass that north pole, you start heading south again. The same is true when you hit the south pole. But here's the crazy thing. Even in our modern understanding of our world, when you head east, you will forever head east unless you turn around. And if you're heading west, you will forever head west unless you turn around. And what God is saying here is, when I forgive you, there's an infinite distance from your sin and me. And you will never get it thrown back in your face again. That's the distance of God's love. The second thing Paul tells us is, we've got to understand how long is the love of God. Jeremiah says that he loved you before you were formed in your mother's 
womb. There is no time limit on the love of God. Psalm says it so beautifully like this. David says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day. And I, there's no time limit of God and his love for you. He loved you before you were conceived. He loved you after you were born, and he loves you as you walk through this earth. And guess what? Nothing could change that. Jesus spoke it like this. He says, I've given them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. There's no expiration date on God's love for you. There's no time that God could say, you're out of bounds, and, and you can be snatched and taken away. Nothing can have an effect on the love of God for you. And Revelation said it like this, even before the formation of the world, Jesus was chosen to be slain, which means it's always been God's plan to forgive you. It's always been God's plan to restore you. It's always been God's plan to love you. There ain't no time limit on the love of God. But here's where it gets so beautiful. How deep is the love of God? What's the depths of God's love? The only way you'll know the depths of God's love is if you understand the depths that Jesus went through to love you. You gotta know what Jesus went through to love you. Philippians says instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. He left the divine place of heaven to be born like a slave and die a criminal's death for you. But it don't stop there. Jesus, when he's at the guard in the night, he's gonna be arrested. He says it like this, my soul is so overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He asks his disciples, stay here and keep watch with me. He says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He's overwhelmed to the point of grief. He's saying, God, I understand what I gotta go through. And if, I, if there's any other way, let it be. But if it's not your will, I don't want it. But it doesn't stop there. Peter says it like this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been saved and healed. It is God's wounds. It is God's death. It is God's sacrifice that you're healed. But it don't stop there. Jesus hanging on the cross with all of sin weighing upon him. He cries out, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why don't you look at me? Because all of the sin is bearing upon me. You want to know how much your God loves you? He went to the worst places possible. He bore the worst pain possible. He went to the depths of the world to grab the hell's keys from the devil and tell him, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, sin, where is your power? Because the resurrected king is here. That's the depths of God's love for you. And I'm humbled that he did it for me. And ends with this, how high is the love of God? I'm going to tell you right now, you will never understand the heights of what God wants to do in your life. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive or mouth can confess all that God has for those that love him. Jesus' very prayer for his disciples, he says, Father, I want these who you've given to me to be with me where I am. He's talking about going in heaven. Then they can see all the glory you gave me. I want them to experience all the glory of heaven because you loved me even before the world began. I want you to experience all of it. But I love the words of Paul when he writes to the church in Corinth. He says it like this. It's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they'll be raised as spiritual bodies. Paul's writing that even when we live in a fallen world, and even when the devil and this world tries to give its best shot, it has no effect on our eternal place and our eternal beings. 
That even in we're on the wrong end of someone else's sin and someone else's pain and someone else's hurt, it has no account for the heights that God will take us. And I remember years ago, I heard John Piper preach this message, and he's talking about Paul writing this church to the, a martyr church, a church that's being arrested, a church that's being persecuted, a church that's being stoned to death and beheaded, a church that's being crucified and suffocating to death on a cross, a church that's thrown into Roman coliseums as entertainment, being devoured by lions and wild animals. And it's like Paul's pinning these words with hope, and he's telling them, yes, the world may come against you. And yes, there may be sin in this world, but it cannot compare to the glory of God. So bring on the stones, because I will be healed again. Bring on the swords, because my head will come back again. Bring on the cross, because I'll breathe life again. Bring on the, uh, the animals and the lions, because I'll be raised to glory again, because there's a hope beyond this world, and there's a hope that's found in Jesus, and there's a resurrection spirit that lives in me. That that's the taste of God's goodness. That's the taste of God's glory. That's the heights of God's love, that we don't live a temporary life. Our life doesn't end when our heart stops. It just begins. That's the glory of our God. And so many people miss that. They live anxious. They live less than. They live without experiencing all that God has for them. And some of you go, well, Mike, how, how do I just taste it? Well, you're not going to like my answer, but you're going to have to go all in. Quit being a convenient Christian and be a dedicated disciple. You got to choose to make Jesus first. He's got to sit on the throne of your heart, not you. But some of you in this room have never chosen Jesus ever in your life. You've never asked Jesus in your life. Maybe you, maybe you are new to church. Maybe all this is new to you. But right now you feel something and you're like, man, I need that. I need Jesus in my life. Some of you have, but you've walked away. You've chosen Jesus in your past, but you've also chosen now to leave and, and live a life that God doesn't have for you. And you may say, well, Mike, how do I accept Jesus in my life? Well, it's easy. The Bible says all you have to do is with your mouth say, Jesus, forgive me. Come be a part of my life. You just say it. But you also believe in your heart Jesus is who he says he is. And he's not riding in a grave somewhere. He's the resurrected king. And listen to me, when you pray, he responds. And you can pray this prayer today and receive his grace and forgiveness and start your journey to understand the depths and the width and the height and the length of his love for you. Taste the honey. And so we're going to pray this prayer together. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads. Nobody looking around. Nobody moving around. It's the most important thing we do. Take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me together as a family. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all my sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I do matter. And I give you my life. Grace move right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, move right now in the name of Jesus. With every head bowed, I want nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm asking you to do something crazy. I'm asking you to raise your hand in just a second. You may say, why do you want me to do that? Listen to me. First off, I don't ever want you to be embarrassed about this. This is the most exciting thing you get to do. Heaven is celebrating right now. You came home, and I'm ready to celebrate with them. But secondly, here's what I want you to understand. You're going to leave this door, this room, and you're going to go out into this world. And the last thing that devil wants is for you to be a follower of Jesus. And I want to pray for you this week. And I want to see your hand in my mind as I'm praying, because I'm going to go battle for you as your pastor. Because you need people fighting for you so you can be all that God has for you to be. So on the count of three, if you made the decision today for the first time or recommitted it, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we're going to celebrate. Three, get your hands up right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. See your hand. See your hand. See your hand in the back. See your hand right there. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. See right here. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church. Get excited. Come on. You can do better than that. We got family in the building. 
Hey, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. But it ain't nothing compared to how proud your God is of you. Welcome home. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, ring ding that bell so you never miss a video or a live stream, and give this a share to one of your friends. And remember, we go live every single Sunday. Till next time, pray God's peace.